Happy Sunday, Cornerstone. Would you stand as we worship the Lord together today? As we give thanks for who He is and everything that He's done in our lives. Come on. This is the day that you have made. Whatever comes, I won't complain. Is in your name, and now your joy awaits my praise. Come on, we say. We lift our hands all over this place today. As the heavens open, we sing these words. Come on. And as we lift our hands, the heavens open, heavens open. So let our lives declare the love our God has spoken over us. And as we Of the goodness of God. 
today we stand in awe of everything that you are and everything that you've done though we are undeserving that we stand here and we say thank you thank you for Jesus thank you for the cross it is only because of the cross that we could even come into your presence God, that we could stand here, that we could worship you. God, we thank you for your goodness. God, we thank you for your grace, your mercies that are new every single morning. God, the fact that sometimes we are not faithful to you, that you are always faithful. God, we can't wrap our minds around what grace is, but today we're so grateful for that grace that has poured over each and every one of our lives. God, those who are followers of Jesus Christ, God, that we can say thank you. You're faithful in every moment, God. Even when things don't look the way that we had expected or hoped, we can still stand here and say that you have always been faithful. God, for every need that is represented in this room today, God, those that are hurting, those that are broken, whatever we may be facing, if it's physical sickness, if it's things going on spiritually in our lives, if it's relationships, God, whatever it is, we surrender to your will and to your way. Not our plans, not our will, but yours be done. God. Let us continually, every single day, decrease that you may increase, God, that you would be the thing that is seen when people look at us, when people look at our lives, that we would reflect your glory, that we would reflect your goodness. And today we say, great are you and greatly to be praised. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Church, if you're grateful that we serve a God that is faithful, would you give him praise this morning? Come on, let's give him praise for what he has done, for who he is. Well, happy Independence Day weekend. Before you're seated, would you find two or three people around you, tell them good morning, and then you may be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Mark. One of the pastors here at Cornerstone, I just wanna welcome you so much and say thank you for, for being here in, in spite of a busy weekend. I'm sure that many of you have plans to go out and be a, at a barbecue or maybe even traveling somewhere else or even just sit at home and do nothing, which was definitely a choice this morning for you, yet you chose to get up and get ready and come to church or tune in online. Uh, but either way, we're so grateful that you can make Cornerstone a part of your morning this morning. If you're new here, if this is your first time, let me invite you to text the word new to 951-425-4425. Let us treat you to coffee this week, just our way of saying thank you for being here with us. If you have any questions about Cornerstone, about any of the events that are coming up or any of the ministries uh, that you're interested in learning more about, our new here team would love to meet you and welcome you. And they also, they also have a gift for you just for being here uh, today. So you can find them out in the lobby on the left-hand side as you exit today. Now also uh, on the patio, you'll notice as you came in that we got the party started for you as well. We have uh, some of the carnival games that we've been talking about uh, that are out there and it's fun for all ages. I'm sure that I've seen some adults out there thinking that it's for the kids, but they're, this kid's competitive out there. Uh, we also have the bounce house and then I've heard that there's a bunch of popsicles as well uh, over in C Kids, and, and maybe if you ask nicely, they'll give you one. Uh, but either way, we just wanted to set up a party for you guys to start off your weekend as a family. Uh, speaking of families, how many of you are parents in here? Especially kind of like younger-ish kids. 
Okay, and how many of you would say that you have everything all dialed in as a family? No problems, no arguments, never a dull moment (laughs) in your house if you're like me. Now, for those of you who have it all put together, go ahead and just tune me out for the next minute. But for everybody else, we have a Young Families Masterclass that's coming up on July the 13th. Uh, We've invited an expert parentologist, and believe it or not, I'm pretty sure that that's a word. Uh, Dr. Kim is gonna be joining us, and she has uh, an expert background in this, and she's gonna be walking alongside of us uh, and answering some questions and bringing some practical tools on you know, how to be a better version of yourself as a parent and also how to raise kids to be the best versions of themselves as well. Uh, The last few years in particular have been a huge challenge and I'm guessing that even as of maybe even today, you've had some challenges as a family. So you're gonna wanna text the word parent um, to 951-425-4425 to get registered for that so we know uh, to make space for you. It's gonna be over in small church. So I hope you get registered for it. It's gonna be a really, really amazing time. So as we give today, I know that there are several ways that we receive tithes and offerings here at Cornerstone. You can text uh, the amount to that number up on the screen. You can sign up online as well. We have a great app that's really easy to use that you can get signed up online as well. Uh, We have some envelopes around the sanctuary that you can pick up and fill out and drop off in one of the boxes that are around campuses as well. So if you have any questions, somebody will help you find it. Uh, But no matter what works for you, whatever's best for you, know that it's making a huge kingdom impact right here in our church and in our neighborhoods and in the nations as well. I know that we just had a team come back from Costa Rica and they were able to build a a home for somebody. And I'll wait so we can tell uh, some more stories and share uh, some more photos from that. But just know that there's always something going on. But really what it comes down to is, is you're in your relationship with God and he has given so much to you. And so it's just a response uh, that we give. So would you bow your heads and pray with me today? Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you that you are here and that you are with us. We value our relationship with you, Father, and we love you so much. And we're so grateful for everything that we have in our lives. We're grateful for a church today that we can come and worship you and learn from the word. So would you open up our hearts and uh, just help us to, yeah, just to hear your voice today and to walk away a uh, change with one or two things, Lord. We th- just pray this all in Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. Happy 4th of July weekend. Oh my goodness. I just heard Mark say parentologist. I had to look that up to see if it was a real word. It's actually a real word. Um, I didn't know. All right, look at the people in front of you, left, right, behind you. Take a good look at them. Take a good look at them. Because these are the people who have stood firm. These are the people that have drawn a line in the sand. These are the people that said, no way are we spending seven bucks a gallon to get out of town. (laughs) Why are you here? Oh my goodness, it's a three-day weekend. So glad to have you here. Um, I'm here because Pastor Andy, I don't know if he's in the room or not. Uh, Pastor Andy, if you remember a week or so ago, he uh, thought he had bad tacos in Mexico. He didn't, he had appendicitis. He had surgery, had his appendix out. He was back to work like, you know, that same day. Um, All that kind of thing, you know, because he's gotta be the strong macho man. And so, This week, we've been just staring at him and looked at him saying, there's something wrong. looks like you have a third arm growing out of your stomach. There's something not right, or you have to deliver something. And so sure enough, back in the hospital, he went with an abscess. And so they were going to have surgery with him again, but they did it by antibiotics. And so I'm sure he'll be back in for surgery next week. And so we'll figure out next Sunday. I don't know what it is with Andy. I'm afraid to even, hey, there he is. I knew you were there. He's here. He's actually here. That big, that big yell out he just did probably created a bulge. I, I know that just happened. So that's what he keeps doing. So glad you're here, Andy. This message is for you. So 
Listen close. Listen very, very close. You know, I'm afraid to ask him, hey, Andy, how you doing? Because I, I'm just always afraid of the answer. He's, he, I gotta go to the hospital. I'm sick. The kids are sick. Shannon, Shannon runs that roost. I'm just telling you right now, she has to care for all of us. She doesn't have any time to be sick between all of them. Yeah, give it up for Shannon. Is she here? Shannon's here too. Thank you, Shannon. So she just runs all that. But we all ask that question of each other, don't we? Hey, how are you doing? And sometimes we just give the vague answer, you know, hey, I'm doing okay, doing fine, doing, doing good, or you know, say, oh, I'm doing okay under the circumstances. Uh-oh, keep walking, because it's gonna go deep real quick. Some people jump right away to you know, their, their health. Say, hey, how are you doing? And they say, oh, you know, I've been fighting a cold, or I've been sick for the last two weeks, or I've been in the surgery, uh, surgery for the 16th time. Or, you know, we quote the doctor. The doctor, my doctor says, and so we answer that way by just the mere question, how are you doing? Or we deflect to our schedule. Say, hey, how are you doing? Oh, busy, woo, busy, crazy. Like, 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 a little busier than you somehow. I don't know, we get this busy word, crazy busy. We think we're so, uh, so busy. I heard someone say, many of us are rushing so fast that we're passing up more things than we're catching up to. Now, if you follow that, good for you. You understand what it means. There was a, a little boy that went to the grocery store and he asked the clerk there for a box of detergent. And the clerk said, well, what, what do you need a box of detergent for? He says, well, I need to wash my cat. And he said, oh, son, this isn't the right soap to use on your cat. But he insisted. And so he bought the box of detergent and took it home. About a week later, he was back in the store and the clerk recognized him and said, hey, how do things go with your cat? And the little boy said, uh, he died. And, and the clerk said, I told you it wasn't the right soap for your, for your cat. And he said, no, it wasn't the soap. The soap was fine. It was the spin cycle that got him. <laughs> now, if you're a cat person, you can change that to dog. It's not near as funny, but you can do whatever you want there. Here's the deal. Sometimes life can feel like we are in the spin cycle. We are spinning round and round until eventually life is spinning out of control. Now, I don't know if that's that for you or you've experienced that or you experience that from time to time or maybe it's right around the corner. What I wanna do is ask you a different question. Rather than how are you doing, let me ask you, how is your soul? How is your soul? And you say, wow, that's an, that's an odd question or it seems really like a big question, but could it be that the state of our spin cycle, the state of our busyness, the state of our crazy schedules causes us to neglect our soul? John Ortberg said, if your soul is healthy, no external circumstance can destroy your life. However, if your soul is unhealthy, no external circumstance can redeem your life. Now you have to ask the question, what is your soul? Because sometimes we just throw that out there and we don't really don't know what that means. It can be very confusing. Whether you're a person of faith or you're still someone who's seeking it out or searching, everyone refers to the soul without completely knowing what it means. We hear people say, may God rest his soul. We say, she is a dear soul. We say, how many souls are, were saved or on board? Here's one I never even heard of before. Two days after Halloween, it's called All Souls Day. I don't even know what that means, but that's a, that's a name for it. Here's what a soul is. And, and this morning, there's not a lot up there because as, as Andy called, I was at the beach, and so I've come home to be with you guys, and so and some of our people were in Costa Rica, so not everything is up on the screens, but if you go to your church app, there are notes there if you wanna follow. Here's what the soul is. Our soul is the center of who we are. It encompasses three things. It encompasses our will, our intentions, and our choices. It encompasses our mind, our thoughts, our feelings, our, our values. It encompasses our, our bodies, our expression, our body language, our actions. Maybe some of you identify with this. It's, it's our OS. It's our, it's our operating system from within. That's what our soul is. It's the center of who we are. Secondly, it is the inner us. It's the inner me. It speaks in silence to those outside, but it screams from within me. It's a place where my thoughts, my hopes, and my, my wishes live. My soul is the real me. It's the real us. It's really who we are. We have this physical tent that we're carrying around, this physical body, this external body, but the soul is who we really are. As much as we can care for our physical bodies, it's the soul that matters. And our soul is the eternal us. It's the part that will leave this place on earth upon death and reside in eternity. Now, here's what James says in Matthew chapter 16. 
He says, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? You see, Jesus was emphasizing the importance of our soul, not just in eternity, but its health here and now. Now, to forfeit our soul or to lose our soul means to no longer have a healthy center that organizes and guides our life. It's no longer our operating system. It's no longer our guidance system for life. Any worldly gain we could possibly obtain becomes useless if our inside world is collapsing. Let me say it this way. Your and my success in the future depends on the condition of your soul. Now, way back in the, in the New Testament, towards the end, there's a small book called Third John. There's only one chapter, only a couple of verses. Let me read to you what John says here. He says, to my good friend Gaius, how truly I love you. We're the best of friends. So here's his BFF. And he says, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for your good fortune in everything that you do. And I'm praying for your, your good health, that your everyday affairs will prosper as well as your soul. Now, who wouldn't want a friend like John who is praying for his health, his wealth, and his prosperity? This is the type of friend that you know knows you inside and out and wants the best for you. Isn't always looking for the worst, but wants the best and will pray that way for you. And that's what John was doing. And he took it even deeper that he was going to pray for the soul of his friend. In fact, John ranks the soul as high as our health, our wealth, and our prosperity. That's how important he sees it. So I ask you that question again. How is your soul? Is it connected to the one who has given you the breath of life, or is it deflated, squelched, ignored, or detached? Has your soul been wounded or damaged? Has the pace of life or the, or the life cycle or, have, or the, the, um, the, 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 what did I call before? The, um, the spin cycle, has the spin cycle of life caused a dryness and emptiness spiritually? Will your soul die a little bit this year because it's empty or will it thrive? See, if we're disconnected or we ignore the internal life, we may not get the outside life that we desire, that God desires for you to have. So what do we do? We need a thriving soul this year. I'll even just boil it down to this summer. We need a thriving soul this summer. And to get a thriving soul requires a very simple principle. And the principle is this, a timeout. Now, some of you may know a timeout just from the sports world, when all of a sudden we need the clock to stop and we need to reassess and we need to reprogram, we need to create a new play, we take a timeout. For some of you, you know it because you have little children and you need the parentologist to come and you are going to discipline them, they're just having a tough time and you send them on a timeout. They just need to take a breath, they need to, they need to step away, they need to go to their room. You're gonna do a timeout for just a moment to kind of recapture yourself, we know it in those terms. Sometimes we take a timeout by just taking a day off or we take uh, a vacation and we just take a timeout and that timeout is vital and imperative to a thriving soul. And so what does that look like? We all want to add margin to our life. And so sometimes we think if we could just have more hours in a day, when in reality, each one of us are granted the exact same amount of time. We have 168 hours a week. That's all we're gonna get, no more, no less. We have 168 hours a week. We wish for more hours, but if we were to actually get more hours, we would just fill them up. It's like wishing for another shelf in the garage. You put another shelf in the garage, you're just gonna fill it up and need another shelf. You gain a few more hours in a day, you're gonna eventually fill them up and you're still going to be pushing the margin. We fill our day, we fill our week with mostly essential things, but we push it to the limits and we forget what it is to take a time out. What we need to realize is how can we become a strategic manager of the margin in our life. We know the hours that maybe we need to work or the hours that we sleep or the hours that we do family, or the hours that we spend doing the essentials or the primary or the important things. And then there's a little bit of margin left over for us. How do we increase that margin? We can't do it by expanding hours. We're not gonna get more hours. We can't even do it by balance. Balancing act of all the things that are important. If I just get better balance in my life, Craig Groeschel, he's a leadership guru in the podcast world. He says, it's not about balance. Balance is a myth. Seasons cause us to go in and out of important things. 
As you're a young parent, your young kids demand most of your time. As they grow older, you're hoping to gain some of the time back and some of the time becomes theirs and they, they get out on their own. That's a great day. Here's what the Bible says about strategically managing the margin of our life. It comes from Exodus chapter 20. It's part of the 10 commandments. Exodus chapter 20 says this, remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days a week are set apart for your daily duties and regular work, but the seventh day is a day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any kind of work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants. I know you have lots of them at home. Your livestock, any foreigners that live among you. He's just saying everybody needs to just stop and take a time out. Verse 11, for in six days, the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. And then he rested on the seventh day. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. Now, I told you this is one of the 10 commandments. This is number four. In fact, it made it in the top five of the 10 commandments. Very important. It's one of the longest commandments. It's all about taking time off or taking a time out. You might think of it like this. A Sabbath day is like heading down the road. You ever get on the freeway and you just kind of in cruise control? You know, you just get your hand up on the steering wheel. Before you know it, you leave the valley and you're in Corona and you go, how did I even get here? I don't even remember the drive here. We just kind of go into this cruise mode and not even know how we got there. Sometimes we're that, that little mouse that's just spinning on the wheel over and over and over again. But you know when you're in a parking lot and there's a speed bump, we all tend to slow down and take a minute, assess the situation, go over the speed bump slowly, carefully and cautiously, and allow that to direct our life. A Sabbath day might be looking at the same thing. The Sabbath is like, like that, that, like that uh, speed bump to soul care. Sabbath just causes us to look internally and take a moment, take a breath, take a time out, assess what's around us and do what's best for our soul. Now there's a few observations I think we need to make about this particular commandment. Because we know it's in the Old Testament, we gotta figure out what is all packed in here that we could apply for today. Was it something that was just Old Testament and we can throw it away? Or is it something that we should take principally and, and apply to our life? The first observation is this, did God really need to rest? I mean, God's God. Now, he did you know, create the entire world, and so there was kind of a lot to do on those six days in which he created it. And so did he need to do that? So from the very beginning, we have an example of God that on the seventh day, it was set apart from the other six days. So I doubt God got tired where probably a better translation of the word Sabbath or took a rest is that he was modeling a need to do something different. The word would be to cease, to abstain, to just plain give it a rest. We can get caught in the trap of just doing the same old, same old routine. We can get caught in the trap of just pushing ourselves so much that we begin to lose sight of what God intended. So God models it for us. He says, every six days, you ought to take a time out. Now, is it important of the six days? We'll get that to that in a minute. But the importance is that we see God modeling the effort, not because he was tired, not because he was burned out. He had a lot to do after the creation of the world and still has a lot to do, but he modeled the necessity to take a break, to do something different. So what is keeping the Sabbath? Is it rest? Is it no work? Is it worship? Is it probably yes to all those. We see throughout the scripture, there are different ways in which to rest. We see in this particular commandment, he says, your rest ought to be one that is dedicated to the Lord. Now there are both theological and legalistic differences that begin to define the specifics of a Sabbath. And we're not here to really deal with that because we know that whatever religion The fact is there is a period of time that is just dedicated to God, a time where our relationship with God is intensified. It's intentional. It doesn't get caught up in a lot of rules. We take a a group to Israel, Uh, side note, May of 2023, we're going back. On Saturday, we, we leave on a Tuesday, we come back on a following Thursday. 
On Saturday, you wind up on a hotel, and Saturday is the Sabbath in Israel. And all of our people do the same thing. We get to the hotel on Saturday, they all get in the elevator, and they push their floor. And they realize the elevator stops at every single floor before it gets to their floor. Why? Because one of the rules is you cannot get in an elevator and push a button because that would be considered work. And this is the Sabbath. And so they just make the elevator stop at all the floors. So you just sit there and wait until you get to your floor. Really bad when you're on the 80th floor. It takes a little bit of time to get there. These are rules that begin to get ridiculous. And that's not what it's created for. It's created for something different. It's created that we might understand what God wants with us and what he wants us to experience with him. There's an intentionality that goes into place. He says, remember, keep it holy, keep it separate, apart, different, unique, reserved from anything else. But the intention is to prevent burnout, to do it regularly, to do it on some consistent basis so that you can re-energize yourself. You see, work is good for us, but at times we need to give it a rest. It's okay to be sick. It's okay to have surgeries. It's okay to have things going on in your life, but sometimes you just need to rest. <laughs> need to take a time out. In the Psalms, it says this, it is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, for God gives rest to his loved ones. Solomon in Ecclesiastes says, Fools are so exhausted by a little work that they have no strength for even the simplest tasks. They don't take a time out to recharge and refocus. Some of you are working so hard, you would be referred to as a workaholic. You don't like to use that word. You just tend to burn the candle on both ends and you're just really not that bright. What? Proverbs chapter 12. This is hard. You don't want to use this in marriage too often. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 11 says this, it is stupid to waste time on useless projects. You don't go tell your spouse, I'm not doing that stuff. Look, the Bible says it's stupid. No. <laughs> the importance here is to understand work is important. Our life and our routines are important. Our schedules and our systems are important, but it requires a time out. Another observation about the Sabbath, what day is it? Friday, Saturday, Sunday, depending on the religion that you come from? It doesn't matter the day, this side of what Jesus did for us on the cross. It just matters that we do it. Colossians chapter two says, don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink, for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. Don't let anyone condemn you for what day it is. It doesn't necessarily have to be attached to the day that you worship, although that we worship on, on Sundays. And so you may consider this to be the Sabbath when in reality, if some of you think back, we used to worship on Saturday nights as well. So was that the Sabbath or was this one and not really that one? All I know is praise be to COVID that we don't have Saturday nights anymore. Did I say that out loud? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say that out loud. It's a time for rest, a time for refocus, a time for restoration, and yes, even a time for recreation. Yes, motorhomes, yes, boats, yes, ski things, and what, what, you know, whatever, I used to, we used to call them sea dudes. They're not sea dudes anymore, wave runners. Yes to all that. Go see the beach, go see the mountains, go see the desert, do you, but make sure it's a time for rest, refocus, and restoration. One more, one more observation about the commandment. It's the only commandment that's not observed after the day of Pentecost. What's Pentecost? Jesus leaves this planet, goes to his heavenly father. The Holy Spirit comes upon us. The Holy Spirit is what lives within us. And so that's the day of Pentecost. So now we're not told to observe the Sabbath after that period of time. Why? Because the Sabbath was all about Jesus in that moment. Matthew chapter 11, Jesus said, "'Come to me, all of you who are weary, "'all of you who are tired, exhausted, burned out by the things of life, all of you that are carrying heavy burdens, these things that are weighing on your shoulders, weighing in your life, come to me and what does he say? I will give you rest. When you connect with me, the rest that you need will come from me. There's no need to get legalistic with rules because the grace of God took care of that. The principle is that we need to take quality time in which to do what is important. And what comes from quality time is making sure there is quantity of time in which to exercise it. It's in him that we find rest and restoration. So 
what does this rest thing look like? If it's not something we're commanded to observe, it's not something that we, we do have principle of God created it. We have some observations that it doesn't really matter the day. It's just a slice of time that we can take a time out for God. So how can we make a takeaway from this? Let me give you the word rest, just so you can remember in case you don't check the notes, R-E-S-T, just give you four things of what we take away as it comes to rest. Here's what it looks like. The first is an opportunity to recharge. Whatever it is for you, I wish I could turn around and just head back to the beach right now. We were there for two days. That for me is my happy place. When I can hear the ocean crash, when I can have sand between my toes, when I can feel the, the sun uh, you know, on, my, on my bald head, it is just rejuvenating to me. It's what allows me to just thank God for his creation to see the, the expanse, the mass of, of the ocean waters, to see people enjoying and having fun and see the beauty. We live right here. Right over that mountain is the ocean. There are people that pay a lot of money to travel here and be on vacation there. And yet it's a drive a distance away, which I know at seven bucks a gallon, it's expensive. But regardless, we don't have to fly and get hotels and all that kind of thing. It is a place that we can experience getting recharged. Now, again, for you, that might be the mountains. For you, that might be the desert. For you, that might be an amusement park. For you, that might be the solitary of your backyard. Wherever that is for you, now, some of you are in here are retired. And you say, wait, every day for me is a Saturday. <laughs> yeah, but are you recharging on any given moment within that period of time? What is it you're doing to recharge? What is your place? What is your pathway in which to recharge? Especially spiritually, emotionally, and relationally. See, when we recharge spiritually when we come together for worship. The Psalms tells us, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Now, I don't know if you're a kneeler. The, the uh, idea here is not that you have to kneel. When we come here, the worship team likes you all to stand for a half an hour. So they want you to raise your hand, put your hand, do all this stuff with your hands. We do all these things. Worship can look different for all kinds of different people. It might be in his word. It might be worship music. It might be solitude, solitude before God. The intention is, how is it you are going to recharge spiritually? How are you going to recharge emotionally? We read the verse earlier. Jesus said, let's get away from the, uh, from, uh, not this verse yet, uh, Mark 6, I'm sorry. Jesus said, let's get away from the crowds for a little while and rest. There's so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't, didn't even have time to eat. Emotionally, Jesus was exhausted. People were coming and going, asking for different things. He was teaching, he was preaching, he was, he was involved in healing and doing miracles, and Jesus was exhausted. He says to his disciples, let's get away for a little bit of quiet time. We just need time to ourselves, times alone in solitude where we can listen to God. Some of us are so busy talking that we don't take time to listen. If we're going to recharge we can recharge emotionally when we just spend a little bit of time in quietness. We can also recharge when we're involved and engaged with community. Hebrews chapter 10 says, let us, neglect our, let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but rather encourage one another. It's getting rejuvenated by being with other Christ followers, with other people who your people are, the people that you enjoy. Maybe today, tomorrow, on this Independence Weekend, you're gonna spend some time with people. It might be family, it might be friends, but it's that place where you just get to relax and take time off and enjoy the company of one another. You get recharged because you get people that care about who you are. They're not just asking you the question of how are you doing? They care about what's going on in your life. So we recharge. If we're going to rest, it has to be a place where we are resting in a place spiritually, emotionally, and relationally getting recharged. The E is an opportunity to engage with God. Here's the first that we read earlier, Matthew chapter 11. Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary, carrying all that weight on your shoulder, carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Some of us may say, I just need more time in my day, and then I can do it. And God says, no, you don't. You need more time with me. Engage with me, and that's what will expand your day. God says, I will give you rest. I am the creator of rest. I am the creator of Sabbath. And so as you engage with me, I will expand your time to be emotionally, physically, spiritually, relationally healthy and whole. 
Are you making time to get to know God? I'm not saying taking time. Are you making time? You say, I, I, I just don't have time to sit down and read my Bible and pray every day. I don't have time to just sit and, and take a quiet moment with Jesus. Then may I suggest, then you're just too busy. You're letting the busyness, busyness of life crowd out the most important. When you study the life of Jesus, no matter how busy Jesus got, he took time to pray. And if Jesus needed to pray, oh dear Lord, don't we need to pray? We should be right behind him. We need to engage with God to experience the rest that he has for us, to allow us to experience relational, spiritual, emotional, and physical health. The S. The S is basically size up your, your purpose on life. The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20 says, my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. See, the kind of Sabbath rest that is of value is that when you can reconnect your purpose in life to your calendar, to your future, when you know what God has for you, what God has planned for you, the spiritual God, uh, job description that God has instilled in you, when you can refocus and get out of the, the routine and the mundane of everyday life and say, wait a minute, what am I here to accomplish? What is my purpose in life? How am I spending the correct amount of time and effort and energy in my marriage, in my family, investment in my friends, investment in my church? What is it that I am doing that is causing everything to get crowded out? And I'm just doing the same old, same old, same old. Time off, a time out helps us realign our purpose. The last thing, the T, is just take a time out. Hebrews chapter four, there's a special rest still waiting for the people of God. For all who enter into God's rest will find rest from their labors, just as God rested after creating the world. Let us do our best to enter that place of rest. Take the time out. Take it, do it, make it happen. If you, do, if you don't do something different, you will eventually burn out and you're gonna get cranky. Look at the person next to you. Do they look cranky? Tell them they need a time out. You don't preach at them. You don't yell at them. You say, look, you're just all bottled up. Go for a walk, go for a drive, go sit in the backyard, go to the mountains, get to the desert, go to the beach, whatever it is that is gonna restore your soul. Take a time out and rest. You are much better to us rested, refreshed, and refocused than burned out in the, in the, in the cycle of life. So shouldn't we as people know what this is? When I was young in ministry, there was a tiny little book that was out that really changed my perspective on this. It was called The Tyranny of the Urgent. And the whole premise of the idea was that we set out to do what's important in life, and yet the urgent crowds out and reprioritizes what's important. The urgent will always crowd out. We can say something's important, my marriage is important, my kids are important, my work is important, but the urgent crowds it out and changes it. The urgency needs to be captured. In fact, it's an opportunity for us to get a hold of our calendar. I had spent the last couple of years really intentionally focusing on some things are just a waste of time. I'm not gonna get any more hours in the week. I'm still gonna have my 168 hours. But I get to maximize, I get to maximize the margin of my life by removing things that just don't matter. And so I dictate to my calendar rather than my calendar dictating to me. You tell your calendar where to go. You tell your calendar what to do. You tell your calendar what's important. And that begins to eliminate then the urgent, urgent things crowding out the important things. I wanna encourage you, if you look at the Psalms, you all know this verse or this chapter, chapter 23. Grandmas sew it on pillows. We have little things on the wall about Psalm 23. And it sounds really cute, but I wanna point something out to you. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I don't know how true that is. I think we all want something. So even if God is my shepherd, Jesus is my shepherd, I'm not sure it removes all my desire and want. We probably don't 
reprioritize that well. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. That, I think, is key. When your soul is burned out and your soul is dying and your soul is not thriving, it is he that restores my soul. And so we ought to make every effort in which to lean into and lean on him because he's the restorer of a deflated soul. But look at verse two. He says, he makes me lie down. See, sometimes we say, I hear all this stuff that he's saying, but I don't have time for any of this. I'm really busy right now. I'll find that period of time later. You know what? God says it's so important that sometimes I need to make you lie down. And God will do what he needs to do to have his servant serve him well. So for some of us, we may need to be made to lie down. I'm not saying that everyone gets sick or everyone gets some physical health uh, situation because of it, but I don't doubt that God can't use it. God desires a refreshed, restored, refocused, replenished soul. So I want to challenge you. It's summertime. I love summer. I'm solar powered. I love when it's summertime because school is out and life just seems a little bit different pace. And we have eight weeks, four weeks in June, four weeks in July. Oh, I'm sorry. June's gone. July and August. We got eight weeks left of summer. What if during those eight weeks, you just chose one part of one day each week to do something entirely different? Whatever your norm is, keep doing your norm. You have routines, you have schedules, you have calendars, keep doing that. But what if you blocked out a little bit of time, just recharge, to engage with God, to reset your priorities and your purpose, and just simply took a time out? What if you put that on your calendar? I don't know what day is good for you. I don't know if it's evening. I don't know if it's morning. I don't know if it's the weekend or weekday. But if you just settled for you for eight weeks, I'm going to do something different each week to prevent burnout and re-engage with the one who created it. And so, Heavenly Father, I pray today for each and every person. I pray, God, in the busyness of life and the heavy burdens that we carry and all the things that just capture our mind and our thoughts, that we would listen. We would listen intentionally, strategically to what you want us to do in a time of rest. God, help us to recharge and refresh, re-engage and refocus. Allow our spirit to be well and whole and, and strong and purposeful. God, I pray that we would not get caught up in all the business of life before we take just a little bit of a time out and enjoy what it is that you created for us. That you would increase our margin, that you would allow us to be intentional, purposeful, and pleasing to you. God, we love you. We thank you for loving us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me? I hope you have a great weekend and find time to take a time out.